what you just witnessed was a flog cancel. Normally, activating the flog first locks you into a two second taunt. While taunting, you're granted uber and knockback immunity, but as soon as the taunt ends, so do those perks. However, they aren't actually tied to the taunt, but to a two seconds timer that's supposed to coincide with the end of the taunt. So if you were somehow able to end the taunt early, you'd still have those two seconds of uber while being able to move and attack as a crit boosted flog pyro. As you can imagine, this is an absurd amount of power for something that can be done by a single player. That's where the knockback community comes in, to prevent explosives and air blasts from knocking the pyro out of his taunt early. You can't be moved while you're taunting on the ground, but what if the ground itself moved? And what if the ground was actually someone's head? As soon as the person underneath you moves, you'll have successfully flog cancelled. Okay, so video over, right? Just jump onto someone's head and taunt, that's all you need to know. Well, there's a reason why you've probably never seen a flog cancel in an actual game despite how powerful it can be. It is incredibly difficult to pull off. But it's not impossible, and in fact it can be done somewhat consistently. I've spent the past two months using nothing but the flog, doing nothing but jumping onto people's heads, and what started as a flashy one-note gimmick has slowly turned into its own unique playstyle, one that can quite literally wipe entire servers. I've played a lot of TF2 over the years, but flog cancelling is by far the most exhilarating and insanely destructive thing I've ever done, which is why I want to share what I've learned. So say goodbye to your soul as we jump into the art of flog cancelling. Starting with the basics, don't even attempt to flog cancel in an actual game until you've thoroughly practiced both detonator jumping and air strafing. Detonator jumping should be pretty self-explanatory, given how small the tops of the Merc's bounding boxes are. As always, TR Walkway is a great map for practicing just about anything in TF2, and flog cancelling is no exception. I'd suggest jumping onto the bots that run down the walkway from multiple different angles and elevations to get a feel for the distances that the detonator can cover. However, flog cancelling will be practically impossible against human players if you don't also know how to properly air strafe. Air strafing lets you make micro adjustments to your trajectory mid-air, which greatly increases the amount of area that you can potentially land in. It's something that you really have to practice on your own to understand. But the general rundown is that you move your mouse to the left or right while holding A or D respectively, without holding W. Alright, so you've practiced jumping onto the heads of bots and think you're ready to do the same against real players. But upon joining a game, you'll quickly be reminded that unlike on TR Walkway, you actually need to worry about your own life in a real game. And unlike bots, humans don't typically run in straight lines. Thankfully, Valve anticipated the need for players to land on top of other players and designed a class specifically for that role, Heavy. Heavy is by far the easiest class to flog cancel on. He's so slow when revved up that you don't even need to think about where he's heading. You can just jump towards where you see him and air strafe a little towards wherever his legs are taking him. But he still needs to move far enough to make you fall and cancel your taunts, right? What if the heavy stands still and denies you of your uber? In my experience, this is almost never an issue because heavies need to shuffle around at all times to make the omnipresent sniper dot aiming for their heads harder to connect. If you're really worried about the heavy not moving out from under you, you can hold down M1 to let them on fire just before you land on them in order to startle them. This does actually work, and you should be doing this to every person you jump on top of, since there's nothing more painful than successfully landing on someone's head and taunting, only for them to stand still and waste most if not all of your uber. Obviously, you shouldn't jump towards a heavy if he's revved up and firing at you. You'll need to wait for him to be distracted. But once you spot a distracted heavy within debt jump range, they're essentially a free flog cancel. And the cherry on top is that since Heavy is so vulnerable when alone, he'll almost always be surrounded by at least a few of his teammates, who will all be dying alongside him as soon as he fall from his head. If you decide to try flog cancelling for yourself, I'd suggest only trying it against Heavies at first, 
since they're by far the easiest class to jump on top of. Does this mean that flog cancelling is only worth doing if the other team has a heavy? Not at all, although that certainly makes things easier. After heavy, the next easiest class to flog cancel on is soldier. That makes sense given that he's the next slowest class, but unlike heavies, soldiers can be jumped on top of even if they're actively fighting you. Nine times out of ten, they won't be able to hit you mid-air. The fact that Soldier is such a commonly picked class across all game modes is also good news for you, since it means you can expect a decent flog cancel candidate in any given match. Sniper is another class that's relatively easy to jump on top of. Again, make sure you light them on fire first to startle them, otherwise they might stay scoped in and waste your uber. The main issue with flog cancelling on snipers is reaching them in the first place. If there isn't a good flank route to take, how can you possibly land on top of a sniper that's hiding behind his entire team? Enter the jetpack. Running the jetpack with a flog full time is not worth it. Trust me, I've tried. But there's nothing stopping you from building flog with a flare gun and switching to the jetpack once your meter is filled. With the jetpack, you suddenly have a much larger radius of potential spots to land on, meaning you have more opportunities for flog cancelling. Snipers that hide behind their teams are now a liability to their team, because should you use the jetpack to flog cancel on them, you're now an ubered, crit-boosted pyro behind the enemy. Just make sure you're holding down M2 even before you land on someone with a jetpack, as that'll give you a frame-perfect cancel should you kill them with a stomp. As for the other classes, landing on them ranges from difficult to practically impossible. Later in the video, I'll cover some specific ways to make landing on heads easier. But first, I should briefly mention the other ways of flaw cancelling. Enemy buildings can, in theory, be an extremely reliable way to cancel your taunt. If you stand on top of them and aim straight down, the lingering flame particles will continue to deal damage even while you taunt. So if you activate Flog right before you destroy the building, the remaining particles will do the rest of the work for you. The damage that they deal depends on the height of the building, so unfortunately teleporters aren't worth your time. With dispensers, however, the particles can rack up an additional 60 damage while you taunt, which is a huge window considering that dispensers have at most 216 health. So long as you activate Flog once the dispenser has less than 60 health, you'll cancel your taunt. It's tempting to rely on the damage numbers on your screen to know exactly when to taunt, but unfortunately they won't add up to a single number if you've also lit other people on fire at the same time, which will often be the case. Instead, you should practice doing it on TR Walkway to get a feel for how long it takes to put each level dispenser within that damage threshold. As for sentries, your lingering flames can also deal an additional 60 damage. But sentries are usually trying to kill you, so good luck getting on top of them in the first place. If you do manage to get onto a sentry, you can taunt right away if you think your team is coming to destroy it for you, though this is obviously very risky. With all this talk about buildings, some of you might be thinking, what if an engineer on your team builds, say, a teleporter and destroys it for you? That would also cancel your taunt. But that's lame. I can't stop you from doing it, but just know that using friendly buildings to flog cancel is not floggers. Beyond buildings, there are a few more ways to cancel your taunt, though they're much more situational. Certain map props have what's called push triggers, which do exactly as you'd expect. They push you off of them. Or you could stand on top of the payload cart and let some low-hanging map geometry push you off. These are obviously very map-dependent, but they're worth keeping in mind. Putting everything together, there are a good number of ways that you can realistically pull off a flog cancel in an actual match. Of course, canceling your taunt is only step one. So let's say you've finally done a successful flog cancel after several failed attempts. What should you do to maximize the carnage you're about to unleash? You've got two seconds of uber, so use it to melt the largest cluster of enemies you see nearby. Don't waste those precious two seconds on the guy you landed on if there's no one else next to him. In addition to those two seconds of uber, you also have the two seconds of knockback immunity that I mentioned at the start of the video. This means that you can't detonator jump while you're ubered, which would have been useful. But it also means that throughout those two seconds, you're completely immovable. There is nothing the enemy team can do to stop you. 
No explosives, no sentry knockback, no air blast, nothing. Since flog cancelling is at its most potent when the enemy team is clustered together, this knockback immunity is easily a positive overall. If you need to close the gap but your uber is still active, you can use the power jack instead. Though speaking of the power jack, do not take it or the detonator out if you're about to round the corner. This has gotten me killed more often than I'd like to admit. Once your uber wears off, the most important thing to worry about is sentries, since they're immune to crit damage. If there's one up when your uber ends, you have two options. Back off or sacrifice your life to get a few extra kills. You could also use your two seconds of uber to kill the engineer and his sentry, but that's a waste of a flog cancel in my opinion. I'll only do that if there really isn't anything more important to kill nearby. So that's it, huh? All that work for a grand total of two seconds? Well, hold on, because there's a secret third benefit of canceling your taunt. Whenever you activate flog, two different timers start. The two second timers for the uber and knockback immunity, and a 10 second timer for the crit boost. Taunting normally wastes two of your 10 seconds of crits, which therefore means that canceling your taunt gives you an extra two seconds of crits to work with. When flog canceling on someone's head, you're also as close as physically possible to the enemy, meaning your crit time isn't reduced any further by the travel time that would have been required to reach them. It may not sound like it at first, but this extended crit time is huge. There have been so many times where those extra few seconds allowed me to eke out one, two, or even multiple additional kills. Hopefully by this point I've convinced you of how disgustingly powerful flog cancelling can be, under the right circumstances. Sometimes you can stop a pub push single-handedly. Sometimes your cancel will only result in one or two kills, making it feel like a waste. And sometimes you'll wait all game for the perfect opportunity, only for that opportunity to never come. Flog cancelling will always be inconsistent to some extent, but there are plenty of ways that you can minimize that inconsistency. First, let's talk about positioning. Flog cancelling is much more consistent when you're on higher ground. That makes sense, you're trying to land on top of people's heads after all, but it's not so much a matter of height as it is speed. The detonator is more than capable of launching you high into the air, but if you launch yourself at a high arc, your airtime ends up being several seconds. You want to minimize your airtime as much as possible, otherwise you give your target time to react and shoot you out of the air or for them to move out of the way. When you have the high ground, your feet are already closer to your target's head elevation-wise, so you can jump at a much shallower angle. You're basically trading vertical speed for horizontal speed. You don't have to be that much higher than your target either. There are tons of places in any given map where you can position yourself slightly above the enemy. You should also take note of any ledges, roofs, or raised platforms on whatever map you're playing on, since they can let you flog cancel on anyone walking underneath without you even needing the detonator. Stairs are also great. You can basically stair stab people by jumping onto their heads as they walk up. Another important part of positioning is where you are relative to the rest of your team. Once you get flog, you should step away from wherever most of your team is, since that's probably where most of the enemy team is focusing their fire. Find some other angle to jump in at while your team is distracting theirs to lower the chances of stray bullets knocking you off course. If the enemy team is rolling yours, you can even try securing a good hiding spot and waiting for them to pass by, single-handedly halting their momentum should you pull off a cancel. Next, let's talk about game modes, or at least the four main ones. King of the Hill is a weird case. Maps here tends to be more open, resulting in both teams kind of spilling out randomly rather than forming large groups. This means that there are tons of opportunities for canceling, but most flog cancels here won't lead to more than a few kills. If nothing else, this is a great place to practice. 5CP is easily the worst game mode when it comes to flog cancelling. Maps are less open than in King of the Hill, but just open enough that teams will usually spread apart into multiple small groups. That's not to say that flog cancelling is worthless in 5CP, but it's undeniably the hardest game mode to make it work in. Attack, Defend, and Payload, on the other hand, are where flog cancelling truly shines. The maps here tends to be more claustrophobic and choke-heavy, forcing teams to clump together into large groups. 
large groups that can be deleted instantly with a single successful cancel. Playing on offense can be tough solely due to the omnipresence of sentries. Assuming at least one is up, you have two main options. You can wait for someone on the other team to overextend, giving you the opportunity to wipe out their entire team behind them and possibly even the sentry as well. Or you can wait for your team to push up, ideally with an uber, and aim for canceling on a stranded dispenser or fleeing enemy. People who are running away from danger tend to do so in a straight, predictable line, making landing on their heads a lot easier. I'd mentioned earlier how flog canceling can halt the enemy's momentum, but here it can be used to extend your own team's momentum. Your teammates push the enemy back with an uber, then you push them back even further once the uber is done, sometimes all the way back to their spawn. Or if you were the one being ubered and you hadn't popped your flog, you can aim for a cancel as you debt jump towards the other team to get your crits right then and there. What if that's not enough though? What if the universally hated flog uber combo isn't enough for you? Well, if you truly want to maximize the enemy team suffering, you can purposefully reserve your flog until the very last second of your uber, once the enemy finally thinks they're safe, only to flog cancel and effectively give yourself an extended Kritzkrieg immediately afterwards. This obviously won't work every time, but when it does, it can win entire games on the spot. And once the round is over and you're switched to defense, particularly payload defense, you'll finally be able to experience flog cancelling at its absolute peak. Playing defensively will inherently be beneficial to flog cancelling. You want to be able to secure some high ground and wait for your enemies to come to you. However, the enemy team may move in unpredictable ways even as they approach you. Except for on payload. On payload, the attacking team needs to stand right next to the cart and push it. What do players tend to do when they push the cart? They hide behind it to protect themselves, as they should, which means that they're effectively crawling forwards along the track, with their heads completely exposed. And you know which class in particular loves to push the payload cart? The class that's also the easiest to land on top of? I'm sure you can see where this is headed. This is the power of flog cancelling. Now, it's not quite as easy as it looks. Sometimes you'll land on the cart itself, in which case you need to run off and try to jump onto someone's head. And if you can't find a good angle to jump in from, you can still get swatted away before you can land on anyone. On the whole though, flog cancelling can be devastating on payload defense. There have been games where I end up with over three times as many points as anyone else, because every time the enemy team tried to organize a push, I was there to stop it. Even if you don't kill everyone, you leave them so weakened that the rest of your team can easily pick them off. What if the enemy team pushes in with an uber? You obviously can't do anything about the uber itself, but players being ubered tends to move predictably, almost as if they have no fear of dying. So if you flog cancel on them, you can wipe the rest of their team as they attempt to push up. Should you manage to stay alive by the time their uber runs out, you can loop back around with a few seconds of crits remaining to take care of them as well. And if they're pushing up with an uber that isn't stock, you can straight up beat them on your own, since again, players being ubered tends to move very predictably. Flog cancelling really is that powerful, and now you know how to exploit that power yourself. Have I just doomed TF2 by releasing this forbidden knowledge? Is every game gonna have Pyro's flog cancelling left and right? I honestly have no idea. One thing is certain, flog cancelling will always be a gamble. Even if you've lined up your jump perfectly and you're just inches above your target's head, what if you get random crit from across the map? What if your target dies before you can land on them? What if they don't react to any stimuli because they're still learning what a video game is? And that's not even mentioning all the times you don't jump perfectly and miss. This is something that will never have a 100% success rate, and that's fine. 
the reward of potentially obliterating the entire enemy team is more than worth the risk of dying for me. Even if the risk was greater than the reward, even if I would get more kills and less deaths by playing it safe, I would still continue to flog cancel because it is addicting. Pulling off something this difficult, something that wasn't intended by the developers, and using it to essentially enter god mode has genuinely fried my dopamine receptors. There are times when I waste a good cancel and die because I physically could not contain my excitement. There is nothing in this game that makes you feel more powerful. So if you're thinking about trying this out for yourself, know that it'll be tough. There will be games where you do nothing but die over and over. But please, stick with it until you get that first flog cancel. As soon as you do, you'll understand what a rush it is and you'll be chasing that high for a long, long time afterwards.